In the years that followed the first trial of 1936, a lot had changed in the Soviet Union. What previous party purges had existed so far, Stalin expanded them to immense proportions. Driven by his paranoia, Stalin ordered the execution of the Red Army's best generals. Nearly 25% of the officer corps as a whole died. By 1938, the purge spread wider and in the end encompassed millions of people in the country. This period of chaos, a number of historians have determined, was an attempt of systematic destruction and restructuring of the Soviet society. Nevertheless, Stalin's motives and methods remain a mystery to this day. One thing, although certainly clear, whatever happened in 1937 to 1938, the Moscow trials remained an entirely separate entity. If in the trial of 1936 the state was prosecuting actual former opposition, in 1937 and 1938 the Politburo appeared to be devouring itself. Neither Pyatagov, Radek, Rykov, Bukharin, Yagoda nor Tomsky had objected or opposed what was happening in the country. This section will attempt to prove that the continuation of the trials was the result of an escalation of inner party disputes namely the attempt of one fraction to oust the other in front of Stalin. On September 25th, 1936, Stalin issued an order. We consider it absolutely necessary and urgent to appoint Comrade Yezhov to the post of People's Commissar of Internal Affairs. Yagoda is not up to the task. Once Yezhov had ousted Yagoda, he began immediate preparations for a new set of trials. For Stalin, this was a chance to go after Trotsky from a political platform, while altogether mask what was happening in the countryside. Karmenev and Zinoviev had been simple terrorists. An image of Trotsky as an international political threat in collaboration with the Anglo-German-Japanese conspiracy would buy him some time. The perfect platform to defend the mass executions would be in place. This is easily affirmed by the trial records. The theme of indictment of 1937 stated intentions to renounce industrialization and collectivization, and they relied on the support of German and Japanese governments. The accused proposed to make territorial concessions to Germany and allow German capital in the country, and in the case of war with Germany would carry out wrecking in industry and at the front. For Yezhov, however, this trial represented an opportunity for personal revenge against Bukharin and Rykov. Already in September 8th, Bukharin and Rykov were brought into confrontation with Yezhov and Kaganovich, in which Radik mentioned his intentions of implicating Bukharin. Two weeks later, having ousted Yagoda in for defending Bukharin, Yezhov was on his own. Yezhov now had the perfect motive. If in the previous trial he declared ambition, in 1937, it would be either him or his enemies at the bench. Yezhov's pattern of action can be easily spotted in the records of 1937. As Radek stated, I gave evidence on the basis of its significance and to the basis of its usefulness. What this meant was that Trotsky would later call not terrorists by conviction, but terrorists under instruction. To many of his defendants, Yezhov promised a reprieve from the verdict if they implicated Bukharin. However, many confessed simply because they managed to make an agreement with Yezhov. Those who couldn't were not brought to trial. They were just executed. The trial records confirm these moves. The list of the accused in 1937 was revised several times under personal instruction of Yezhov. Those who fell out of the list disappear from historical records altogether. The threads were finally drawing together and in 1938 there was enough testimony and evidence to hold a trial against the so-called rightists. As far as Stalin was concerned, this meant a few less semi-independent voices among his supporters. 
He was already displeased with Yagodin and Bukharin for accusing him of favouring Yezhov. In the context of mass, restructuring and purges in the countryside, he could not afford even the slightest doubts in his policy. Paranoia kicked in. The true show had began. Yezhov had managed to manoeuvre among the Politburo and get Stalin on his side. It was time to finish the job. If we had so far established motive, it's now time to reveal Yezhov's method. There was now limited resistance from the accused. They were now powerless. In a meeting with Vorozhilov and Yezhov, under threats of assassination of their families, Bukharin and the rest agreed to give full confessions. Yezhov's signature in a trial scenario, however, is best spotted when the indictment was revised a few days after the interrogations. Along with an attempt to kill Lenin, planning an overthrow of the Soviet government, the accused now had to admit to working with the former Tsarist ep- espionage agents. The accusation itself posed no political significance in relation to the trial. But for Bolsheviks' audience, no former of life, no more untrustworthy character n- could exist than a Tsarist spy. This was then a personal attack instigated by Yezhov. For him, it was not enough to kill Bukharin, he had to destroy his memory. Further evidence is presented in Bukharin's testimony. Vishinsky. Then why was it so easy for you to join a bloc which was engaged in espionage work? Bukharin. Concerning espionage, I know absolutely nothing. Vishinsky. What do you mean nothing? Bukharin. Just that. Vishinsky. And what was the bloc engaged in? Bukharin. Two people testified here about espionage, Sharangovich and Ivanov, that is to say, two agents provocateurs. It is from this minor rebellion in the court hall we can infer the personal nature of Yezhov's attack. Bukharin had already confessed the most heinous crimes of murder, conspiracy and terrorism. This would be his last stand, a minor victory in the most vicious war.